that first week, all I did was research four to six hours a day. And for the first time in months, I was getting up at 8 a.m. with a spring in my step. And by the time that I had turned in that first email sequence, I knew that I'd found my next passion and my next specialization. Welcome to episode two of season nine of Live in the Feast. I'm Jason, aka Rez, helping you grow your business by having a conversation with someone who's been there, had success, and built a business designed around the life that they want to live. That's Live in the Feast. If this is your first time listening, hit that subscribe button so that you get notified every time a new episode drops. Live in the Feast is in your podcast app of choice. If you've heard the show, go ahead and leave us a review and ratings on iTunes or drop us a comment in Breaker or CastBox. This season is titled Building a Better and More Profitable Business. It's all about leveling up our businesses to help create a more profitable and sustainable business. Especially in this COVID and soon to be post-COVID time, I think it's important to be able to learn from one another in any way that we can. Today's co-host is Summer Oase. Summer is an email conversion strategist and copywriter for SaaS and e-commerce brands. She helps clients like Workamajig and Copy Hackers, as well as agencies like Long Play Brands and Fix My Churn, increase conversions, boost sales, and fix the money leaking gaps in their emails. She's also a creator of the e-commerce email boot camp and the emails done right newsletter, which is an amazing newsletter. If you just want to get on her list, go ahead and do so. You could do that at summeroase.com. That's S-A-M-A-R-O-W-A-I-S.com. And we've got that link in the show notes. In this episode, we're going to dive into why being curious is a huge benefit to building a better business and how it can expand your network. We're also going to talk about how to be your own client in order to accelerate your growth and the easy way to create value through emails for your clients. I really enjoyed this conversation and you will too. So let's get into it. Feeling like you're in a silo all by yourself with no one to bounce ideas off of? Are you looking to get predictable revenue into your service-based business? Do you want better clients who respect you? Well, gain the support from like-minded developers, designers, and other creative professionals providing client services inside a Feast Club. Forget those stale articles from 2008 giving you advice on how to run your business. It's 2021. Join Feast Club today and get access to a community, including myself, where we share what we're working on in real time, strategies and resources that work in today's market, and ideas and support for one another in a safe place. You'll get access to a private podcast, which has bonus episodes from some of the guests in this season that you can only get inside a Feast Club. You'll also get access to a monthly one-hour virtual meetup, a private Slack and Circle community, member-only content library, access to message yours truly directly. Also, you're going to get exclusive expert workshops from folks like Kaylee Moore on pricing, Robin Kennedy on email, and Nick Gulig on sales, and so many more. There is no better time than right now to learn from those a few steps ahead of you and leverage your skills to help and support others to grow all of our businesses together. So if you want to check it out and join a community that's built on the saying, a rising tide raises all boats, head on over to feastclub.co today. I hope to see you on the inside of the club. Now, let's get back to the show. Feasters, welcome to another episode of Live in the Feast. Today, I am super excited because I get to talk all about email. (laughs) And you guys know that I love email and I mention it quite often, but 
with today's guest, Summer, well, that's what you do. Email's done right, right? So welcome. Thanks, Jason. Hi, thanks for having me. So before we dive into all things email, um, first of all, where can folks reach out and learn a little bit more about you online? So two places. One is summerwest.com, which is my writer site where you'll get to know all you know the kind of emails that I write. And the other is emailsdoneright.com where I pick an email fight every Wednesday. And so I have this thing where I challenge the status quo and I talk about whatever's bugging me about emails in my weekly newsletter. I love that. Pick a fight. <laughs> As a New Yorker, you know, I, I, I got to love that. Yeah. I mean, and so you say like you pick a fight, right? And so, you know, and I know, you know, Val Geisler, she was a former guest on the show and, you know, she does that as well, right? Like she does those tear downs and things like that. I've done that somewhat in the past when in a previous version of my services where I, you know, worked really on e-commerce side of things. I'm curious to hear when you pick those fights, do you actually ever have that brand person company ever come back to you at all and say, hey, thanks for this, or even maybe get a little defensive? Um, so I don't pick fights with brands. I pick fights with the way most brands do emails, right? So I would, you know, maybe pick a fight about why most so many brands have their entire email as an image or the way that most brands do their welcome emails or how they do their abandoned cart emails. So I don't pick a certain brand unless it's to appreciate something about them. But if you're doing teardowns like Val did and you're in the e-commerce space, I my, my recommendation is pick a brand big enough that would just not care. Because the entire purpose of a teardown or of a review is to showcase your expertise as a freelancer, right? And as a strategist. So pick a brand that wouldn't care that might not even see it, but people who are your ideal audiences uh, or ideal uh, clients will see it and will see that you're not afraid to point out mistakes or missed opportunities by bigger brands. And it's just, you know, lends you that authority by association in a way. Yeah. And I think, I think it also allows your ideal client and your audience to then kind of know where you plant your flag, right? Like, you know what you stand for, what your what your expertise is in. And then they say, okay, well, yeah, this is who I want to work with, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So when clients come to me, they know that I'm going to insist that they put their customers first when it comes to their emails. It's what my entire, every fight that I pick every Wednesday is about it, right? So they know that I'm going to push them. I'm going to ask What's going on here? Why are you not doing it the way, you know, why aren't you doing it this way? What made you decide to do it the way that you're doing it? I'm, I ask the hard questions. And so brands that are comfortable with that are the ones that are going to come to me. But brands that are comfortable doing way, things the way they've always been done and that they, they're not interested in changing things around or, you know, revamping some stuff, I'm not a good fit for them. So this is a great point because because we're here talking now, I can be somewhat blunt, but basically in the midst of a conversation with a lead, I try to always get them to realize that what got them to this, this conversation that we're having right now didn't work for you, right? Because otherwise we wouldn't be talking. How do you help your clients make that realization? So I, because I'm an email I don't like confrontations as much, right? So, which is why I flag my, uh, I plant my flag the way I do it is because I, wanna, I don't want to have that conversation. So I'm not comfortable having those conversations. But when I do need to, I simply tell them, let's test it out. The way you're doing things versus the way I'm doing things. I, I want to do things. And so with email, A-B testing is super easy, right? We set it up. We let those emails fight it out and then see what's um working well. And, and this way I, and I totally tell them like, I'm open to being proven wrong. Like maybe your audience just responds better to the way that you're doing emails. And I feel like it's a learning opportunity for me as well, because when my emails lose, when the way I set up an email sequence loses, and it has been known to happen, I want to go in and do like a complete autopsy of why this happened. Because if this strategy had worked so well for the one brand, what was so different with their audience that they didn't respond to it? And so I treat it like an opportunity to learn 
And it just reinforces my belief that we need to put the customer first, which means that they understood, the client understood their customer better than I understood their customers. And so it's just another you know, lesson for me to learn. Not to get too geeky on the, the emails tech side of things. After you perform these tests and you really dive deep into the autopsy, how do you do that? Case in point, an example that I, I ran two months ago was on preview text. I kind of wanted to just see how preview text and email worked with my audience versus a client's audience. And really what it was, was a client's audience, the indication of the emails, at least from just seeing the numbers, was that they wouldn't necessarily, it's a very technical audience. So the curiosity kind of subject lines didn't work. So if we were able to double up on this very specific subject line with preview text, and then basically either show the preview text or don't, right? So a half and half, right? Well, preview text for my audience, open rates went up. It sort of kind of makes sense. But yet for this audience, they actually went down. <laughs> and so I was like, wait a second. I'm like, preview text is supposed to help, right? <laughs> but the thing is, it's like, it's just really just on the open rate. That's what I'm testing there. So I'm curious, like how I can do an autopsy, make it an assumption why that is, because while well, we just doubled up on the information, to bring them in and well, maybe it wasn't as interesting or that we were giving up too much information of what's on the email side or things, right? How do you go ahead and then diagnose the winner and loser of a A-B test? So I look at the data and I look at things like copy and you know how mature the email list is, but I am not a tech person. Right. So when I am working with a client, my favorite client is the one that has their own implementation teams. And if they don't, then I go out and hire somebody and partner with them and do that. So the easiest way for me to figure out is to talk to their uh, subscribers. Like I go in, I see, look, I perform my own hypotheses, and then I talk to the subscribers to see if what I'm thinking is the reason is actually the reason. So I don't assume I go to the source and ask. What was it about the emails that, you know, made you decide not to open it or to open it? And so insights from that are just not helpful for me. They're also helpful for um, the client. So you just flat out reach out to them in a different email or do you? Yeah, I reach out in a different email. So I would say something like we're working on improving your email experience. We would really appreciate it if you could just hop on for like a quick 15 minute call. And then depending on what industry or, or company it is, we offer incentives if needed. But a lot of times, if you've if the company or the brand has done the hard work of building brand loyalty, then they don't even need incentives. People are just happy to talk because they love the brand. Yeah, I like that. I mean, that's that's something that I've always done inside of my own businesses. I'm, I'm never afraid to ask a question, right? Like I'll just reach out to them and say, hey, why didn't you buy this thing? Or why didn't you take this action that I had hoped you take took, right? As a service-based business, right? And so most of the audience that's listening to this right now is they're developers and designers. And I know you focus more, really just you focus in on e-commerce and SaaS, right? Have you ever worked for clients that are in the service-based Yes, industry? so I create, this is like I carved a third niche for myself without realizing that I was doing it. I create onboarding and nurture sequences for course creators. And I am, I am a course taker. Like my accountant, the one question that my accountant asks every month is, why do you buy so many courses again? And so I am always looking to learn, but I'm also always evaluating. And I feel like that curiosity that, you know, as that comes to me as a strategist, where I ask why things are the way they are, also just translates into that. So it's actually how I landed Joanna Weeb as one of my clients. I was part of her course and it's a six month course plus a mini mastermind, right? So after all the content has been released, it's just a mastermind then with, you know, weekly Q and A's access to Joanna Weeb and Amy Posner. And so once the course was over and I, you know, because there's a Slack group, we talked to all the freelancers and entrepreneurs in there. And so a lot of them started saying, oh, the course is over. We're going to leave now. And I couldn't understand why they were doing that. And I was like, because to me, 
the price of the mastermind was a no brainer because I had access to Joe and I could reach out to her with my very specific problems and get a very laser focused answer that was uh, designed for my business. And so I, upon talking to people, I, they didn't realize that they had that option, that they had access to Joe and Amy and they could reach out to them and ask those questions and a bunch of other stuff that Joe was providing for her students. And so I reached out to Joe and said, do you know that people are leaving the course in the mastermind? And her response was, oh yeah, that always happens because now the course is over. And then I told her like, but people are leaving because they don't know the value that you're providing. And Joe's response was, oh, that's interesting. Summer, I see a pitch in your future. And so I pitched her like four hours later, I sent her a pitch with, for two email sequences. I was like, Joe, I want to onboard your students and take them through the entirety of the six month course. That would be what I would call the onboarding email sequence for your course students. And then I want to nurture them to stay past the course and into the mastermind so that they can continue doing the work and get those wins. And so she said, yes. And that's how I, you know, um, started creating emails for course creators. I have a couple of questions on that. But before I do that, the reason why I was asking e-commerce and SaaS versus services, because a lot of people think like, oh, well, that's just the e-commerce. Like that works for that, but that doesn't work for what we're doing B2B and all the rest of it. I'm curious to know from your perspective, because I have my own thoughts, from your perspective, how much of an overlap is there? There's a lot of overlap, to be honest. So when I started doing emails, I got my start in SaaS, right? Because I, I started working for Val Geiser. She gave me my start in emails. And so most of my beginning experience in emails is with SaaS companies. And I realized that because SaaS companies put so much focus on their customers, on their onboarding journeys, the way I see emails is heavily influenced by that. And so whether you're a SaaS business, whether you're an e-commerce business, or whether you're a service provider, if you're focusing on your customers and clients first, then a lot there's a lot of overlap because ultimately you are putting the people you serve first. Just, you know, it's just a matter of what business you're running. But if the core of your business is the same, then there is a lot of overlap and more, more similarities than differences, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I find that too. And, and it was funny because I, I was having a conversation about two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago with someone. And they said, like, I noticed that you are in the circles of like D2C brands and things like that on Twitter and you engage with that and, you know, experts in those fields, but then you, you don't, you don't have D2C clients. And I said, well, I have a handful, very few, but the concepts are the same. And for me, at least on that side of things, <laughs> the testing is a lot easier, a lot faster, and they, they can get that data quicker. And I'm such a data-driven person that things like a shopping cart abandonment behavior and things like that, okay, a service business doesn't have a shopping cart per se. They sure have key pages on their website that is close to a shopping cart that you can use the same concepts against, right? And so if three years ago, shopping cart abandonments were campaigns that were three or four emails that went over the course of two or three days, but now it's a lot more shorter, right? And so learning that from the D2C side of things is, well, okay, maybe let me test it on the service side of things. Maybe, maybe it could be the same, right? And so you stand out in that way. So before we dive into some other questions, because I have that on the, I have that thought on the, what you were saying about the, the online courses, I always like to ask, what has been your defining moment in life so far? Making the decision to leave the UAE and move to Pakistan. So I was born and brought up in Pakistan, but I moved to the UAE in 2007. I had graduated, gotten married, and moved to a new country within 10 days of these things happening. And so I completely built a new life for myself. And where, as far as I'm concerned, to me, UAE is um, heaven on earth. It's the only country that I've been to that I feel completely safe outside traveling alone at 4 a.m. in the night. And so to me, that place is just, I had my kids there. Uh, we had our first house there. We had our first car there. There was a lot of like, as a couple, we had our, you know, all our firsts there. And my husband grew up there. 
And so making the decision to move to Pakistan was really, really tough because uh, my husband's entire department was moving countries. And he was, you know, everybody was given the option of moving with them. And my husband realized that if he said no, then layoffs were coming. And so we realized that, okay, so the smart decision is to just move. Uh, and that was incredibly hard. Like, even though our, our brains and our minds said that this was the right move, our hearts were just not ready. But we made that tough decision. And after moving here, I made the decision to take my freelance business full time. And that kind of just really paid off in spades because the growth I have seen in the last two years is something that I didn't see in 10 years of freelancing in the UAE. So I feel like that kind of really just paid off. That was a defining moment for me that I could have chosen to dwell on, on what I had lost. But instead, I made myself busy. I built up, you know, grew my business, built it up, created a new life for myself here. And even though I had grown up here, it was like moving to a new country because all of a sudden I didn't know any of the bus routes because everything had changed. But there's a lot of construction, so I wasn't really sure where everything was. And the worst part of it was that nobody, I could like in, in, in UAE, I could go and get my own things done without having my husband to, you know. Everywhere we go, patriarchal societies are very prominent, but in Pakistan, it is a little bit too much. I cannot go into a government department and get anything done without my husband or my dad with me. Nobody would take me seriously. And so that was super frustrating to get used to, but it's just one of those things that I had to relearn because I was navigating the society and doing, doing it pretty well before I moved to the UAE, but living there, it just kind of spoiled me. And so that has been, I feel like a defining moment uh, and moments essentially to relearn all of that. Yeah. I can't, I can't even imagine the, the adjustment, especially in that sort of, you can't get things done without somebody else. Right. And so I'm curious to hear though, how, how many clients do you have that are, are local? None. All my clients are in the U S. Okay. So you said one thing there that had you stayed in UAE, you would have kind of just coasted sort of thing, but yet the move, it accelerated all of, you know, in the past two years, what was the difference in the business that made that? So a bunch of things, right? So I started focusing on emails. And the other was that I was working, I had more support here because my parents are here. My, my siblings are here. My family is here. And so suddenly I didn't have to pay for a babysitter. They could just go to my mom's. And my mom was like, like, my babies are here after like so many years. I, you know, just leave them, like, leave them overnight, stuff like that. And so I had all these free hours to work on my business. And I was taking Joanna Weeb's course, 10X uh, freelance copywriter, and I just started implementing everything that she was teaching us. And the more I implemented, the more my business grew, and it just kind of spiraled from there. It's funny, like when you have that moment of clarity or, and just space to actually dive in and get things done, it's amazing what rolling up the sleeves and getting things done can do for the business. My wife and I, we lived in an apartment in New York City. And we just had our first son. Well, at that time we were, basically she was traveling three hours commuting every single day, both ways, right? And it was crazy. Like she hardly got to see TJ at all, maybe like an hour at night, you know? And I was home with TJ all day, but yet I was like, okay, I'm trying to juggle nap time, I'm juggling feedings, I'm juggling like all of these things plus work. Right. So it was kind of flat. Right. And so we had decided that we were going to move out to Long Island closer to her work. And then her company got bought out and her company, basically the company that was buying them out was, it was in California, I think it was or something. It wasn't in New York. And so they were going to use this as like a remote location and they were just going to do some layoffs and people that were redundant between the two companies and such. And it got to a point where my, my wife, who was a director and she managed a team of, I think it was about 20 people, something of that nature. And she was basically told like, your, your position's redundant. You can come back, but all of the flex time, meaning they were allowed to work from home sometimes and things like that. And they just knew that she wanted to be closer to home. They basically said, you know, 
It's up to you. Yeah, you they made it back. impossible for her to continue. And that's what I told her. Like, we literally sat down that Saturday night and I said, because she had to give them an answer on Monday. I said, look, why don't you just stop, quit, whatever, whatever the terminology that they're going to throw at you, stay home. I'll do the work. I can accelerate the business farther just by putting the hours in faster than you can sitting at somebody else's desk. Let's just give it a go. Like, let's try it that way. And we were in the process of buying a house. So at that time, we were worried that the bank wasn't going to give us a mortgage because we were kind of leaning on her. And it was just like this real stressful time. But I look back on it. I'm like, that was awesome because that was the pivot point. We made a decision that our hearts were in it and just it made some sense. And now we have two sons. And so it's like, you know, it's just, she's a freelancer now. She does her thing and, you know, works a couple hours, watches the kids, those sort of things. And and it's great, but it's just, it's amazing once you actually decide to roll up the sleeves, put in the work, have that space and support system underneath you to help you with that, what can be done. Yeah. And it's also, I feel about farsightedness because when we're taking these leaps, it's, it gets really uncomfortable and uncertain in the beginning, right? And that's where the fear comes in and tells us, oh, this is stupidity. You have like the safety net. Why are you leaving it? But knowing that we're making this decision for the right reasons just makes it easier to huddle down and do the work so that we can get to the other side where things are easier. Absolutely. I mean, that's once you do that one time, put yourself in that uncomfortable position, you realize that when you come out of the other end in a much better space, you're like, oh, I could do this again. <laughs> it's not as hard the next time. Awesome. So I want to go back to what you were talking about being a part of a course and community and to highlight a little bit about what you saw inside there, which then like you said, turned into a pitch and we wound up being Joanna being a client of yours and so on and so forth. One of the things that I spoke about inside of Feast Club recently, which is a, a private community for developers and designers that I facilitate, I said one of the things that a lot of people underestimate is being a part of a community of like-minded folks. Meaning if you're a developer, chances are that if you're in a community with developers and designers, well, designers are going to need development help and vice versa, right? There's developers are going to need design help and so on and so forth. Look for those opportunities there that then maybe just, you know, intentionally or not intentionally being a part of that community allows you to then open a new channel for, you know, new business to come into your world, so to speak. I'm curious to know, based off of that first interaction there of being a part of Joe's community, have you rinsed and repeat? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so this is a longer story because I'm going to take it from the bottom. <laughs> um, stop me and tell me it's getting too long, right? But I got into emails because I joined Joanna's community, right? That's where I've met Val. And at that point, I had been a content writer for about 10 years, but I was severely burned out. You and I just talked about it before we started recording. It was to the point where I didn't want to get out of bed. And I kept coding higher and higher, hoping that somebody would say no, right? And it got to a point where I was coding $1,000 for a blog post and leads would just say, that's fine. And I would hate the work and I wouldn't want to do it. And so I realized like two or three modules in of doing like taking the course, I realized the problem wasn't that I was, you know, burned out. That was part of the problem. But the real problem was that I was done writing content. I was no longer interested in it. And so I started experimenting because one of the things that Joanna teaches is to be your own first client. And so I started, you know, made a list of all the other kinds of copy that I could try my hand on. I tried website copy. I, I didn't enjoy that much. Sales copy literally made me cry tears. And I never want to do it again. Also, so I tried emails. And at that point, I had like a very small email list for a blog that I had at the time. And I used to really enjoy writing those emails. So when Val 
sent out a call in the Slack community saying that she had more work than she could handle and that she was looking for subcontractors. I reached out to her and I said, listen, I haven't done emails for client, but I want to, and she knew that I was trying other kinds of copyright. So it's like, I want to try my hands at email. Will you please give me a chance? Don't miss deadlines. I'm a fast learner and I don't make the same mistake twice. And so she took a chance on me, gave me two weeks to write, um, I think it was a re-engagement campaign. And that first week, all I did was research four to six hours a day. And for the first time in months, I was getting up at 8 a.m. with a spring in my step. And by the time that I had given, I had turned in that first email sequence, I knew that I'd found my next passion and my next specialization, right? So that was like the first instance of the community elevating my own business. And then as I started pivoting into emails, I started passing on the content work that was coming in, right? So the leads would, I would, you know, post it in the Slack group saying, hey, this is a lead. I don't want to do content anymore. So, you know, reach out on the so-and-so email address. And so there's actually a referral and a, and a opportunities uh, channel in the Slack group. And so anybody who is, you know, has a wait list too long or a client isn't a good fit, they know and realize that it might be a good fit for somebody else. So they go in and post their, leads there, right? And people can reach out and see what's going on there. So I feel like in that way, the community has been really, really instrumental in growing a lot of freelancers' business because we're networking every day, we're sharing our challenges every day, and we know what kind of projects somebody else is looking for. So when one comes across our desk, that's not a good fit for us, we know who to pass it on to. That's been really, really helpful, not just for me, but for countless other course takers and, you know, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think for me, I've never run an ad for my services. I've been in business full time for myself for more than 10 years. And I hear that all the time. And I get tweets and things like that, like, hey, what do you run for your ads? I'm like, well, I don't run ads. It's just not a part of my business. I thought back a long time about how I get business and it's just really, it's about the relationships and being a part of those communities and courses. As long as you have your eyes open and your ears open, you could see opportunities where you could step in, provide some value and that then that value accelerates further, right? Like it turns into a client, maybe a long-term client, repeat client, so on and so forth. And I think it's just such an underutilized marketing channel that you can have. And I don't mean to go into buying a course or a community, go into a community and then just start plastering your, your services every which way, but it's more of like a, um, you know, just being a part of a community. Yeah. And a community isn't always inside a, inside a paid course, right? There's a community on Twitter. There's a community on LinkedIn. There is a community on Instagram where I all I do is post memes on my private account that nobody else can follow without like me approving them. And so I get leads on all three channels. And interestingly, last year, I think, or, or two years ago, my website got a virus in it, right? And so I had to delete everything and then re-upload everything. And in doing that, I somehow messed up my Google Analytics and SEO. Like I completely forgot to reinstall the SEO plugin. And I just went my merry way and I didn't notice anything until somebody reached out to me from my newsletter and said, do you know that when we Google your name, your own website doesn't come up? And so I realized that, oh, there's no SEO for me. My site isn't even indexed, but I hadn't noticed because leads were still coming in. And it was only because I was constantly networking with the communities that I had become a part of. And um, 10XFC is just one of them. But I'm also super active on Twitter. I'm an email strategist and copywriter. So, and email geeks is one of the things that I constantly tag and look into, even though I'm, I don't participate as much. Yeah. So, and LinkedIn also, I, it's not like I post every day. I post maybe once a week, but I feel like social media is kind of like a thread that people pull and just then follow. Because if somebody's following you on Twitter, they're going to check you out. They might click through to your website. Then they might go to your LinkedIn and see what, you know, what your previous experience is. And so I've always felt that communities can make or break your business. And if you can help somebody, start with that. Because we all know something or someone that um, we can help. 
I love that. I couldn't say it any better. I wish I wish we had this conversation prior to me doing that <laughs> inside of Feast Club because, I, you know, it was weird. I was getting a lot of replies back from that email that, that sparked this whole thing. And people were like, oh, I never really thought about it that way. I kind of just go in there, I do my thing and I get out. Right. And so like what you're saying with Joanna's students, the cohort would go through for the six months. And then once the six months was over, they'd be like, OK, well done. See you later. You know. But yeah, if you hang around long enough and you be a part of that community, definitely. I'm an avid fan of that. So before I, we wrap up here, and I want to be mindful of your time, for someone who's running a service-based business that, let's just say that, because most people, they don't pay attention to email. Right? Like that, at least the people that I talk to, they're just like, oh, I don't have an email list, this thing. I'm like, well, you do have an email list because just, if you have clients and you've been in business for a little while, you have an email list, right? What's the one thing that you would say to somebody that says, okay, well, yeah, I don't really email, but I know I want to, and I know I, I should, but I'm afraid of just pressing that send button and that's just what it is. What would you say to that person to say, well, just this is the one thing that you should start doing that then makes it that much easier later on? Focus on helping them. And not just by asking, oh, what I can help you with, by thinking about what they would find helpful. It could be something as simple as an article, or it could be as simple as a teardown or a review uh, of something that they're interested in, right? So I am an email strategist, and whether somebody comes into my email newsletter or somebody's a client or they reached out to me about something related to email and they somehow ended up on my list, right? I know that they're interested in emails because that's what our interaction was about. And so I'm going to send them a quick tip maybe that would make their next email, right? Something that would give them a quick win because it's not about what you can get out of them. It's about what you can do for them, that's how you create value. And once you create value, you start staying on top of mind for whoever your target audience is, right? And so when they think of somebody, uh, when they need help with what you do, you're the first person that they think of. So e-commerce emails, and it doesn't happen overnight. For me, I've been talking about e-commerce emails from let's say March, and it is only just now that things have started, you know, my name started popping up when people, brands have started thinking of me and coming to me when they need email help. In the beginning, nobody knew me, but I knew a lot about e-commerce emails. And so my focus was always on helping brands. I talked about things like what apparel brands were doing wrong with the way that they, you know, that way we order jeans online. And it was based off of my experience of buying, trying to buy jeans online. And just small, simple things like what in your life can you relate that will help your target audience serve their people better, essentially. And I think that that's, that's so important too. Like I, a lot of my clients, they want that brand. They want that logo to be out there. They want that. But I'm like, but you're a small business, maybe even micro business. If you inject any sort of personality, a story, hey, I went out last week and I saw this, did this, this, and this, and this is how it relates to this tip. That's how you draw people in. And that's when people want to read the next thing. I think that's, I'm glad you echoed that statement because for, for me, when I struggle writing an email, I'm like, okay, well, what happened to me over the past three days? Right? Like I just try to think of something like a story, like a couple of sentences even, right? And like, just think about that. And then how does that translate into what you share to help somebody? So I'm going to go off this interview and even sit down and write my emails done, right? Newsletter that's due today, right? All day I've been thinking about what to write because I have so many ideas and I don't know which one to pick. And a lot of times when that's the problem, I think back to what I've talked about when it comes to email, right? So what conversations have caught my eye in the email community or what has been my experience? And so this week I'm pretty 90% sure that I'm going to be talking about the fact that some brands don't really care about Black Friday, Cyber Monday, because for them, Thanksgiving is a bigger holiday or a bigger event. And I know that because a brand reached out to me. Um, I do these live email optimizations. And so a brand reached out to me saying, they've already written the emails. We just need your eyes to make sure that, you know, we do the best possible job and, you know, they're really uh, customer focused. And so as I was doing this live call, I actually asked them, like, why are you doing Thanksgiving? And they said, that's the biggest sales day for us. 
it's bigger than Black Friday, Cyber Monday. And so it just made me realize that there are blind spots in our knowledge and the way we see things. And so, you know, that's just one of the things that happened in my week that I can potentially talk about in my email newsletter. So just focus on what's going on in your life. How does that relate to your work? How does that serve your audience and put them first? Love that. Awesome. So what's up next for you in the next six to 12 months? I did a beta launch of my course for e-commerce emails. Uh, It was like an e-commerce email bootcamp for uh, copywriters. And that did really, really well. So next year, I'm going to be focusing on that. I'm going to do an actual launch instead of just a beta launch where I just email my list and ask for anybody who's interested. And so I plan on, and I do, I love, apparently I love doing things live, right? So the course was taught live. I'm finding that I like live optimization calls and I want to explore more of that. Even though I'm like a socially awkward person, I don't warm up to people that easily. Like it it takes me a while to open up. And so it's so interesting for me to realize that I enjoy the live aspect of teaching and optimizing. And so that's something that I want to explore. The newsletter is always there and I might, might just launch a show. Like it's a podcast, but with video on. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Be on the lookout for that for sure. Yeah. And it's, it's funny. My wife is like, I don't understand how I'd much rather do things live too, rather than like, you know, we were talking about a presentation before and stuff like that. I'd much rather do like a live Q and a rather than a presentation. And my wife's like, I don't know you have no idea what they're going to ask you. I go, yeah, but that's all right. They're all here for the same purpose. And I can, I have no out. problem saying, Oh, I don't know. That's such a good question. I'm going to, I need to think about this or do some research and I will get back to you. And then I ask for their email address or where I can reach them. And then I do follow up because it's a learning process. There's nobody in the world who has like all the answers and I sound really wise here, but it was a hard lesson for me to learn. (laughs) (laughs) But you learned it. That's great. Awesome. Well, Summer, thank you so much for coming on and sharing some wisdom with us again. Where can folks reach out and say thanks? So my email address is contact at summerwest.com or sign up for the emails done right newsletter at emails done right.com. And you can also look me up on Twitter, which is where I hang out all day, every day. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah. And we'll link up all of those in the show notes, obviously. Again, thank you very much for your time and sharing your experiences with us today. You're most welcome. Thanks for having me. And for everyone listening, until next time, it's your time to live in the feast. Mm -hmm.